We saw in the last lecture that if the elements in an array are sorted in, say, ascending order, it actually opens up a whole new world of more efficient methods for searching that array for some target value. But when the elements are in random order, that means we have to rearrange them before we can actually take advantage of any ordering. And that's what we mean when we say we want to sort the array. Suppose we have an array A of five integers that we want to sort from smallest to largest. The current state is described on the left, and the target state, I mean, what, what we'd like to end up with, that, that's what we show on the right. Naturally, computer scientists for decades now have devoted much time and much energy to devising uh, very interesting, very efficient algorithms for sorting, and we'll talk about a bunch of them. But in this lecture, we're going to cover a few that are easy to understand, easy to write, but actually not that efficient to run. Uh, we'll discuss more efficient algorithms a little bit later in the semester. The first algorithm we'll talk about is the selection sort. And the basic idea of selection sort is really straightforward. Uh, the idea is we just look through each position i, and for every position, we want to find the smallest value in the array from that position through the end of the array. And we take that smallest value that we find, and we exchange it with the position. You might also consider taking a look at this static chart. Before we begin, we have our unsorted array. Then after the first pass, we examine the four, well, the smallest value that, in, that is in the array so far is the 1, so we swap the 1 and the 4. Uh, then we move on. The 2 is our current element, and that is the smallest element in the array right now, so we leave it as is. Then we move on to the next element, which is the 5. Well, if we look from the, uh, between the 5, 4, and 3, the 3 is the smallest element, so we swap the 5 and the 3. Then we move on, then we move on to the 4. Uh, we see that the 4 is the smallest of the two elements that are left, 4 and 5, and after that, we are completely sorted. Before we actually implement the algorithm for this sorting method, there's a couple of things we want to note. First, if the array is of length n, we only need n minus 1 steps. One thing we're definitely going to have to do is find the smallest number in the array, and we're going to have to do some swapping of different elements within the array. So those are a couple of tasks that we're going to have to get done. It's also worth noting that uh, when we write the code for this sort, we're going to use strict inequality, that is, less than, rather than weak inequality, which is less than or equal to, uh, whenever we're looking for the smallest remaining value. So if two values are equal, that won't pop as a less than or equal to. We're only going to count pure less than. So here we can see both the algorithm and some code for the selection sort. For each i from 0 to n minus 1, uh, we just want to find the smallest value from a sub i all the way to the end of the array. And we want to store the index of the smallest value. Then we just want to do the swap. You know, we, want to, we will exchange the values of a sub i and a sub min index if we need to. You can see in the Java implementation that I reference a, a static helper method called swap here, which takes a and i, or uh, an array and an, an index, and uh, the, the min index as well, the, the two elements that we want to swap. We'll also use a method find minimum, which returns the index of the minimum element in the array. This cleans up our code a little bit, and uh, it's nice to break down a task into a couple of subroutines. At this point, it may be worthwhile to, uh, to stop and take a look at those two helper methods. Start with finding the minimum value in the array. Uh, find minimum takes two parameters, the array and the position where we want to start the search for the minimum. And it just returns the index position of the minimum element in the array. We use a for loop to do this. It's pretty straightforward. We'll start min index at first, whatever the first element we want, we want to start looking at is. And we will have the loop run until we find uh, the smallest one in the entire array. Swap behaves just as you would expect. Uh, it stores the, uh, the first element in a temp variable and just exchanges the two values in the array. No big deal. So that's selection sort. If I had to summarize it, I'd probably summarize it as take the current element in the array, find the smallest element at or after that element, and swap them. Then do it again after moving on to the next element in the array. The second of our relatively inefficient but still easier to understand sorting algorithms is the bubble sort, which perhaps you've seen before. A bubble sort, the big idea is this. If we have a list of items that are stored in an array, a bubble sort is going to cause a single pass through that array to compare adjacent pairs of items. So that means whenever two items are out of order, they get swapped. You can see that happening right now. 6 and 8, those are in order. 8 and 7, those are out of order. So we swap.
Now, as you might be able to predict, uh, we don't have to go all the way through every element of the array doing full passes for each one. If we ever iterate through the entire array and don't do any swaps, that means that the array is now in sorted order, which means we can stop running the algorithm early. Saves us time, saves us resources. That would be the efficient way to exit bubble sort as soon as it's, we're sure that it's already done its job. Here's what that's going to look like in, in a sort of static step-by-step -step form. If we start with our unsorted array, 5, 4, 2, 1, 3, well, the first comparison is the 5 and the 4, which gets swapped. The second comparison is the 5 and the 2, which gets swapped. The next comparison is the 5 and the 1, which gets swapped. Final comparison is the 5 and the 3, which gets swapped. And we can see that the 5 has bubbled its way to the top of the list. It's our highest value, and we're sure that it's in the right place. Then we start another pass, and we do it again, this time going just from 4 to 3, starting with the 4 and the 2. Naturally, since 4 is less than 2, those would get swapped, and so on. Here I present a sort of pseudocode algorithm for bubble sort. You can see it has a nested loop structure, the outer loop controlling the number of, uh, of passes through the array, and that's those are going to get smaller and smaller. The inner loop controls the pairs of adjacent items, the side-by-side -side items that are being compared. And so once again, if we ever make a complete pass through the array without actually doing any swaps, then we know we're sorted and we're good to go. We can stop running the algorithm. The way we reflect that efficiency in this pseudocode is by saying, well, uh, we're going to keep doing passes as long as we haven't yet finished our n minus 1th pass and as long as we have actually made a swap in our last pass through the array. As soon as either of those is false, we'll stop because we know we're sorted. And here we can see the Java implementation code of bubble sort working on an array of ints. It actually looks essentially the same as the pseudocode. Take a moment, pause the video, and read through this code for yourself. Now, one crucial difference between the algorithms for selection sort and bubble sort that we presented is that bubble sort provides an opportunity to exit early, provided that the array is sorted. That's different from selection sort. And actually, selection sort then doesn't take advantage of data sets that are already basically in sorted order, whereas bubble sort would. Right? Bubble sort gives us a chance to finish the algorithm before running through the whole thing unnecessarily. Insertion sort, our third algorithm and the last one for the day, is, a, is sort of an attempt to take advantage of that, uh, to take advantage of the array's partial ordering if it exists. The big goal is this. On the kth pass through an array, we want the kth item from element 0 to k to be inserted into the right place among the first k items in the array. Now, that's sort of a mouthful. It's hard to think through with the variable, but uh, you can think of this as the way many people sort a hand of playing cards. You have your hand of cards, you take the last card, and you stick it in the beginning. And then bit by bit, you take the last card over and over again and just insert it wherever it needs to go so that you're gradually building a list of cards that are in order, starting from the beginning of your array. If it's helpful, here's a description of the insertion sort algorithm. We'll have a counter k going from 1 to n minus 1, where k is the index of whatever array element we're trying to insert into its proper place. So we'll get that element, and we'll set some counter j to k minus 1, and essentially the element right before the one that we want to place, directly to the left of it. And then we're just going to decrement j until we find the right place to stick that element that we're trying to insert. So we're going to just get going to count down until we find it. The net result here is that at any moment after a pass through this array, if we were just looking at element k and, and trying to insert that into the right place, that means that now the first k elements are in sorted order. I highly suggest take a look at the animation of this sort to get a better intuitive understanding of what's happening. Here's a static example. right? If we, if we start with an unsorted array of 25143, well, the first element we're going to look at is that 5. 
Okay, we start by looking back at the element before the five. That's where J is gonna start. Well, the element before that is a two. If we are thinking about where we want to insert the five, we don't need to insert it anywhere because it's in the right place. So after the first pass, the array still looks the same. We move on, our new K is uh, zero, one, two, meaning that we're looking at the element one, which is this element number two in this array. And we start look by looking back at the five and the two. Okay, well, if we compare the one and the five, we know we need to take the one farther back. We'll compare the one and the two. Looks like our, our, our value to insert actually needs to go before the two even. So it gets inserted right at the beginning. And now after the second pass, we have one, two, five, four, three. We'll take a look at four for our next pass. And it uh, turns out that four, if we compare it to five, we see we need to insert it back there. Uh, and then if we compare it to two, we know it needs to go after that. So the four will go between the two and the five. Finally, our last one to look at is the three. And if we start comparing uh, the three with the elements behind it, that means first the five, then the four, then the two. Well, we see that the two is a little bit too far. So the three gets inserted after the two and we end up with a sorted array. Very briefly, we'll present the Java code for that algorithm. And it's essentially the same. Um, again, the big idea here is that at any given moment after we finish a pass, we know that if we just looked at element k, that now the first k elements are sorted. So if we just looked at element one uh, and we finish that pass, that means that the first element is in the right place. If we just looked at element two uh, and we finish that pass, well, now we know that there are two elements that are in the right place at the beginning and so on. So once we get to k as the final element in the array, we know that all the elements in the array will be sorted once that pass is done. Now we can use any of those three sort methods with an array of objects, it just takes a little modification. If we assume that the objects implement the comparable interface, well, that means that they're gonna support the method compare to. That means we'll have to have that. And then all we have to do is replace the element type of all the array param parameters with object. And we just make the, uh, we just make the calls uh, to equals equals or less than or greater. We just change those to compare to. You can see the, what the code looks like here uh, for the find minimum method. All we're doing is uh, taking an object now instead of an int. Uh, we're casting it to comparable so that we can use compare to, and everything works essentially the same. No big deal. At this juncture, it's going to be worthwhile for us to test the sorting algorithms we've just uh, examined. So what we have here is a sort of skeleton of a tester program for these sort methods. Uh, the program is going to load an array with 20 random integers between 0 and 99, and it's just going to display those array's contents. It will run a sort method, and it will display the array's contents again, this time ostensibly sorted. We define each sort method and whatever helper methods it uses as static method. That's important to note if you're reading through this program. All right, now this code is sitting in your lecture code for this unit. Uh, feel free to open it up, and you can see it's really easy to run. Okay, we, uh, we generate our data sets, uh, we print the array, and then you can just decide which of the sorts you'd actually like to run on the array that you generated. So for instance, right now, we're running insertion sort, and uh, so if I just click run, we can see it very handily generates the initial unsorted array, and then afterward we see the printed version of the sorted array can try commenting out uh, insertion sort and trying another method. And if you like, you could even tinker around with the sort methods as well uh, to add in some print statements so you can see what's happening a little bit more clearly if that's helpful to you. Main things before you close up shop, be sure you can run a selection sort on an array like 87645 and show your work through each pass. Uh, same for bubble sort. You can just do that until the eight arrives until at the end of the array and know how you'd proceed from there. Think about how a selection sort, a bubble sort, and an insertion sort would work with an array that is already sorted. How would they behave as we've described their algorithms here? And finally, modify the bubble sort method so that it can, it can handle an array of objects, not just events.